Trudy, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get going. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank and you, did you want to, are you going to do a couple slides in the beginning? Yes. Thank Perfect. you. And then I'll stop and let you, let you share. So thanks for clarifying, Trudy. Sounds great. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that wherever you're joining us from, and you are in the midst of this heat wave, like we are in Texas, I hope that you are doing okay and staying as cool and safe as you possibly can. But for now, for the next hour, I'd like you to welcome you to Digitex's webinar series, Hot Topics in Texas Digital Higher Education. And our hot topic today, and I shouldn't be using that word hot right now, should I, is everything you always wanted to know about inclusive access, but were afraid to ask. And I am Judith Sebesta, and I serve as the executive director okay. of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas. And if, if everyone can mute themselves, I would, I would appreciate that if you can. Thank you. Except for you, obviously, Trudy. Just a quick few words about Digitex. Um, we were founded in 1998. We serve 50 public Texas community college districts. Our mission is to assist Texas community colleges in providing learning, learners and education without barriers. And our initiatives are primarily to support course sharing across Texas community colleges via our partnership with Acadium, our le leadership of the Texas Quality Matters Consortium, we support open educational resources across the state and beyond. We, we uh, subsidize membership in the state authorization network, as well as the Community College Consortium for OER. I should have added that to the slide. Hi, Una Daly, the director of CCC OER, joining us today. And we also conduct a, a research in digital higher education, broadly conceived. This webinar will be recorded, archived, and available on the Digitex YouTube channel, and we'll send a link to that recording on the YouTube channel to all who have registered for the webinar today. And as I had mentioned before, but if you're joining us after I mentioned it, we do have live closed captioning available, thanks to Nicole Throne from our wonderful captioning partners, Caption Sync. And at the end of the webinar, towards the end of the webinar, our amazing program coordinator, Heather Walker, will put a link to a brief webinar evaluation form in the chat, if you will uh, be so good as to complete that if you have a moment. It gives me so much pleasure to introduce our wonderful presenter today, Trudy Radke, consultant for Spark and most recently instructional technologist and designer at Moore Park College. Before this, they served as Open Education Project Manager at SPARC. In this role, they spearheaded advocacy and implementation for initiatives to make education more open and equitable, including inclusiveaccess.org, an initiative in which Digitex partners to raise awareness about the challenges of automatic textbook billing. Trudy's background is in educational technology, online education, and OER at community colleges. As an OER specialist and consultant, they have worked to create, remix, and revise over 100 OER textbooks for the California Community College system and beyond. Prior to their role at Spark, Trudy was an educational technology specialist at Imperial Valley College, a border school that primarily serves first-generation college students. Trudy's advocacy work has involved helping colleges create sustainable, and equitable OER materials for students. As a keynote panelist for OE Global 2019, Trudy advocated for bringing students themselves into the OER creation process, probably before many of us were doing that ourselves. In 2021, Trudy was selected as a research fellow for the California Alliance for Open Education. And the last thing I wanted to mention a little more uh, personal about Trudy is that their commitment to open is motivated by personal as well as this professional experience. As a low income, first generation college student, they have firsthand experience with not being able to afford college textbooks and the affordances that open education hold for students like themselves. Thank you so much for presenting for us today, Trudy, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Let me just uh, stop my share so that you can share your own slides. And again, please, everyone, take a moment to introduce yourself. Let us know where you're from. Um, if you're, <laughs> if it's really hot there, if you'd like to mention that, or if you're luckily uh, escaping this heat wave. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn it over to you, Trudy. Well, thank you so much, Judith, for this fabulous introduction. I feel so welcomed and, and truly honored to be here. So today, uh, specifically, 
And I was going to give a bit of an intro, but I think Judith really covered everything. So I'll just reiterate that uh, as a consultant for Spark, I manage inclusiveaccess.org, and that is uh, how we're providing you this presentation today. And the title of our presentation is Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Inclusive Access But Were Afraid to Ask. So my goal is that by the end of this presentation, you will no longer be afraid to ask and that you will have a ton of great questions for me. I'm going to try to leave a nice chunk at the end for questions. Um, if it's extremely pressing, please feel free to drop it in the chat during the presentation uh, and I will do my best to address it then. But like I said, we will have a nice chunk at the end for questions as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. There we go. Okay, so just a quick kind of agenda for this session. So first we're going to review the background on the textbook industry shift to inclusive access models and kind of what is motivating that shift. Second, we're going to examine myths versus facts of these models. Third, we're gonna to touch a little bit on Texas and inclusive access. And finally, we're gonna explore resources that can help you navigate inclusive access programs. All right, so I just generally start with a little bit of statistics just kind of get us all in the right headspace. Um, if you've worked in textbook material affordability or open education, this probably is a pretty familiar statistic to you. So this is from a 2021 student purge report. Two in three students say they decided against buying a textbook because the cost is too high. And I usually give a quick blurb here, but as Judith has mentioned already, uh, I was a first-gen college student, so I find a lot of myself in these types of statistics. Um, so this is a passion for me, not only professionally, but personally. All right, so we might all know, but just in case, and to make sure that we're all on the same page, what is inclusive access? What is an inclusive access program? So inclusive access is a textbook sales model that adds the cost of digital course content into students' tuition and fees. I've heard inclusive access described as a Netflix for books. That's not quite a perfect comparison, but it is kind of a pithy way to conceptualize this. So somewhat of a textbook subscription fee, if you will. All right, and what is inclusiveaccess.org? So in a nutshell, we are a community-driven initiative to raise awareness of the facts about automatic textbook billing in order to empower campus decision makers in selecting informed of textbook affordability solutions. So my academic background is actually in history. I have my bachelor's and master's in that subject. So I would be remiss if I didn't uh, start this off with a little historical context. I need to provide the historical context that we all kind of understand where we're coming from in this conversation. So inclusive access programs started to pop up around the early 2010s, but they didn't, well, maybe more like mid, but they didn't really gain traction until about the late 2010s. As evidence, you can see this Inside Higher Ed article was published November 7th, 2017, inclusive access takes off. So how does inclusive access work? So what are these programs and why did they become so popular so recently? So first we're gonna talk about how most of these programs work. So first, they usually start with an agreement between an institution, a bookstore and publishers. The bookstore comes in often as the disseminator of the content from the publisher. Second, digital content is delivered to students at the start of the course, and it's typically through the learning management systems, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, et cetera. Students have a period to opt out before they are automatically billed for the cost. So not all of these programs, but most of them are on an opt out basis, which means that if the student does not want to uh, participate in the process, they are going to have to take steps themselves to actually opt out if they want to buy and purchase their materials elsewhere. And finally, after the course ends, students typically lose access to the content. Now, I want to kind of go into a little bit more of what I mean by typically. So when these programs first came out, usually students like a digital rental model only had access to the textbook for either the semester or sometimes up to a full year. Now, because more schools are requesting further access, some programs are starting to offer perpetual access for these digital textbooks. Um, the reason I say typically, and I like to caveat, is because even if a student is offered perpetual access, let's say for a calculus book that they might use up to three, even four semesters, um, they're usually given a DRM copy, which means that yes, they are given perpetual access to the copy, but the copy is usually heavily protected under certain copyright restrictions. So there's like digital rights restrictions management put on the document. And what I mean by that is usually the student can't like mark up the document and they also most importantly can't transport it to another device. So if they download that digital book onto their computer, they can't 
take it to another computer or put it on their phone um, if they ever decide to purchase a new computer. So perpetual access is growing, but it's still quite restricted. All right, so how do inclusive access programs vary? Most campuses deploy it course by course, but we are seeing a growing adoption of program or campus-wide inclusive access programs. You could think of that as like a textbook subscription for the entire campus. Second, students typically get billed the cost of their specific materials, but sometimes they are billed a flat fee or it's included in tuition. And that model is much more common for a uh, campus-wide inclusive access adoption. And last but not least, access is mostly limited to expiring digital materials, but occasionally there are longer term access or print rentals. So that longer term access is what I was referring to, this growing rise in this um, restricted but perpetual access. And then occasionally print options are available if a student desires that. However, the caveat here is that usually if the print option is even available, it's not for all the digital materials, but if a print option is available to them, they generally have to pay an additional fee on top of whatever they're already paying for inclusive access to access the print copy. So it's kind of considered an extra if the student wants to pursue that. What vendors might promote this model to you? Uh, pretty much anyone with a name in publishing has an inclusive access program at this point. So Cengage, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, Macmillan, Norton, as well as bookstore operators such as Follett, Barnes & Noble, and some courseware uh, vendors have also gotten into the inclusive access game. So Red Shell, Vital Source, et cetera. So I've kind of talked about these models of inclusive access and I've given some general similarities and some general differences. Now we're gonna dig into the specific models themselves and how those differ. And just a clarification, these aren't called, they're not called a la carte and flat fee externally. These are kind of like internal terms that we use to conceptualize how these different inclusive access models work. So the first is a la carte, where students are charged the cost of a specific material they have been assigned. So this is much more common if like, let's say just one chemistry class in an institution, the professor has decided to adopt inclusive access for his course or his sections. That's more common in that scenario. The flat fee scenario where students are charged a flat amount based on how many units or credit hours they are taking is more common for a campus-wide adoption. The flat fee they are charged is the same for every student, no matter what their specific materials cost or if they are free. So if an instructor, if let's say out of the five instructors, a student is taking that semester to leverage open educational resources and they don't charge anything for their materials, that's great, but the student will still be charged that flat rate that won't eat into their cost at all. So here's some examples. So at Murray State, we've got an inclusive access course for chemistry. Each student is charged $119.98 for their chemistry textbook at the, right before the course starts, and it's delivered to them through their learning management system. So this would be an example of a course adoption. And then at Delgado Community College, they have a campus-wide initiative. So it's $25 per credit hour for every student for all their textbooks that semester. So if you're taking 15 units, that comes out to about three. $150, and I've, I've done this presentation enough, I should know that number, but as I mentioned, I was a history major, not a math major, but it comes out to around $350 or so dollars for the semester for all of their textbooks, um, 15 units. So that would be an example of the flat fee model. Okay, so now we're gonna dig into the fun stuff. This is my favorite part of the presentation. Myths versus facts. So basically this is where I break down uh, selling points that inclusive access vendors have made. And then I dig into the background of those selling points uh, to determine if they are what they appear to be. So the first one we call savings or spin. So this is a great place to start because probably inclusive access number one claim to fame is that the textbook materials are more affordable with inclusive access programs. Uh, publishers and vendors know that textbook affordability has been a huge conversation in higher ed for the past well, over 10 years now, 15 years. So inclusive access does seek to lower that cost um, for students and campuses, or at the very least, that's the selling point of inclusive access. So on the surface, generally, there is a cost savings in inclusive access programs. The question we ask here at inclusiveaccess.org is, how are they calculating that cost saving? That's the rub for us. So let's give a little bit of background into textbook industry uh, pricing practices. 
So as you can see from this graph, college textbooks had outpaced inflation for the past 20 years at a pretty aggressive rate. And the reason for this is that anytime uh, vendors, these, the textbook industry saw a dip in profit margins, they really just ratcheted the price up of the textbook and at an individual basis to offset that price loss or that um, uh, intake loss. So the CEO of Cengage, Michael, I can't remember his last name, Michael C. He actually mentioned this in an interview in 2017. He referred to it as a magic price lever. So anytime institution, like anytime these vendors noticed a dip, they would just increase the cost of textbooks. So something we do a lot at organizations like Spark when we're dealing with an industry um, and we're trying to determine, you know, if it's an equitable industry in higher ed, we look at past practices to determine future trends. So our concern with inclusive access is that there's nothing really to prevent inclusive access programs from kind of following a similar path that the prices of individual textbooks have over the past 20 years. And what I mean by that is we've subpoena, uh, subpoenaed, oh my word, we foia'd many contracts from across the country from public institutions on their inclusive access programs. And while there is contract language that indicates that the vendor must report to the institution if let's say that flat fee for credit hour is going to increase from $25 to $30 a credit hour, while the vendor is required to notify the institution, there's no contract language that actually puts a price cap on that per credit hour charge. So based on how the textbook industry has acted in the past, we have some concern that as more institutions across the country kind of buy into inclusive access programs, there's incentive for the industry to slowly but surely ratchet up that flat fee price over time the same way that they have done with textbooks. So like I said, we look at past practices to predict future trends. So inclusive access programs haven't existed quite long enough for us to have any really good data on that, but it is a concern that we have inclusiveaccess.org um, have, and we encourage any institution that's deciding whether or not to leverage one of these programs to kind of look for contract language and maybe even discuss putting a price cap in there with vendors. Okay, the second point we refer to is convenient or confined. So the second probably biggest claim to fame from inclusive access programs is the access to the content, specifically when students have access to the content. So because it's digital dissemination and it's put into the learning management system before the class even starts, inclusive access programs are very proud of this fact. And they say, this is a way that all of your students have their textbook the first day of class, no more of this like waiting for everyone to get on the same page, you know, up to two, three, even four weeks sometimes at the beginning of a semester. So while it is true that because it is digital and it is put into the learning management system, theoretically all students should have that first day access. Our question is, while that's true, does it constrain students as consumers? So here's a trend in student spending from roughly the mid 10s to the early 20s. You'll notice that overall, the trend in student spending on, on course materials declined pretty steadily. Uh, and the reason for this is that students are just incredibly savvy shoppers when they realize how expensive textbooks were. And I, I can even speak to this from my own experience. I got creative. Um, I had a, another friend that was also a history major. We would purchase books together. So we'd go in on books together and then just kind of share them. Um, you know, students will choose to go look for a used copy on Amazon if they can find one that is the correct edition. Um, and then of course, the unfortunate open secret that we all kind of know is that sometimes if students get desperate enough, they will pirate materials. So students kind of found a way around these high textbook costs. So it decreased. You will, however, notice that right around 2020, 2019, and there's kind of this uptick. So there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that because of the pandemic, there was reduced access to lower option to lower cost options because of supply chain issues and all that kind of stuff. And the second reason is that publishers actually increased their prices. They once again, um, in kind of this delicate time, used that magic lever and just increased the prices of textbooks to offset some of their their profit loss. Once again when we're talking about you know industries and large corporations we really feel that looking at past practices is a great way to predict future trends so this is kind of where our concern comes around this all right the third thing i'm going to address here we call support or stymied so basically uh inclusive access we believe has the potential to have some effect on faculty academic freedom 
and their ability to choose materials that they believe best meets their student needs. So what do we mean by that? Well, this, is, this really has to do with the way that inclusive access programs are onboarded at institutions. So as Judith mentioned, um, my previous and now even current experience uh, has, evolved, has revolved a lot around online education. So as ed tech specialist, instructional designer and technologist, um, and in those roles, I'm often responsible for kind of onboarding ed tech that I think will be good for the institution. And then, you know, purchasing it, getting it onboarded, getting everyone trained, selecting it, all that stuff. And I see a similarity between the way that institutions onboard, you know, ed tech subscriptions and inclusive access subscriptions, which is interesting because of the way inclusive access programs work, because often they're getting adopted at this like campus wide or institution wide or district wide even sometimes level, they're treated like a subscription. And subscriptions generally, when they're for the entire institution, fall under the purview of administration. So it's kind of this interesting dichotomy where we're still actually talking about course materials, which is distinctly under the purview of faculty, but because of the way the course materials are disseminated and paid for in this subscription model, that automatically generally falls under the purview of administrators. So there's a little bit of this disconnect. As you can see from the graph here, um, from our research and also research done by Bayview Analytics, uh, this study was published 2019, administrators make around 44 44% of inclusive access decisions for campuses. So our question is how can we involve faculty better in these conversations about inclusive access because even though we understand logically why it's falling under administration because it's a subscription model, course material is under the purview of faculty. It's an academic freedom uh, you know concept and we need to protect that and make sure that faculty have a say uh, in, in the course materials that they're being asked to use or that the institution is suggesting that they use. All right, so we're really getting through this. Oh my word, I'm moving very quickly, goodness gracious. Okay, well, good, because this is actually one that I really am passionate about. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of extra time here. Um, our final thing we're gonna talk about in myths versus facts is deal or data mine. So this has to do with the fact that as digital subscriptions, uh, inclusive access models have the potential to collect a lot of student data. And our question is how, why, and what are they gonna do with it? So first I'm gonna get to this graph and then I'm gonna kind of broaden out a little tiny bit. So this was done by, let's see, yeah, 2020 student perks. So on a scale of one to 10, a 2020 study revealed that one, you know, being a poor understanding of publisher data collection and how that's utilized, and 10 being a perfect understanding of publisher privacy policies and what students are actually signing away to when they click into their textbooks, most students scored about a two. So most students are not, you know, incredibly aware of what they're actually signing away when they accept the terms and conditions to access their digital textbook the first time they use it. So generally it comes up as a pop-up, they open their book, and then this little window comes up and they have to click OK in order to actually access the content. And I, I use this example that I'm about to share quite frequently in this discussion, which is that as an ed tech specialist and instructional technologist, part of my actual job was combing through ed tech contracts to make sure that we were not only getting an incredible deal, which is always very important in public ed, but also that the tools we were going to use had proper accessibility checks, that they weren't going to be you know, siphoning data and sending it out to third parties. So long story short, I got pretty good at reading contracts to make sure that they were fair for students. And I even, in my everyday life, don't always read the terms and conditions. So I did this, I read terms and conditions pretty much professionally. And there's still some days, you know, when it's not an ed tech contract and I'm just, I'm, you know, I've downloaded something on my computer because I'm thinking it'll help Zoom work better or something. And that little pop-up comes up and it says, do you accept the terms and conditions? I'm clicking it, I'm clicking it, and then I'm moving on because you know I have a Zoom meeting in five minutes. How much more so are students just, they're just gonna say yes. They're just gonna click that button because they need to access the course material so that they can get a good grade on this upcoming test. So what we'd like to see explored a little bit further when institutions decide to onboard inclusive access programs is what is the responsibility of the institution to make this student data collection clear to students because the industry and vendors usually aren't being super transparent with students. It's just that little pop-up and it never comes up again. So what is our responsibility as institutions to 
you know, actually be transparent with students and provide this information in a place that they can see it and actually will see it and access it on, you know, here's what data is being collected, here's why it's being collected, and, you know, here's how you can opt out if you don't want your data collected in that way. I think, I really do believe that data collection is, is going to be um, kind of, it already is a huge conversation, but I think it's going to become an increasingly large part of the discussion in higher ed, uh, especially as the pandemic has just really accelerated this shift to online and digital learning. So there's the institution and the student, you know, comprehension piece. The other thing, so I'll, I'll zoom out for a little bit. The other thing I think it's important to consider is that, you know, in 2022, we're no stranger to large tech companies <clears throat> even incredibly reputable tech companies uh, experiencing data breaches, right? And then their the data is stolen, data is compromised, which, you know, because higher ed has to be concerned about FERPA, et cetera, that, that can be a huge, a huge risk that an institution is taking. Um, and last but not least, how the data is being used by the institution and also how the data is being used by the vendor also really needs to be taken under consideration. So a lot of these uh, programs, utilize what they call reading analytics, which is basically, it tells you when your student opens a textbook, how often they spend on a page, what pages they flip to, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that it's, it can be really empowering to have you know, vast amounts of data, but making sure that the contract language is not siphoning this off to third parties, which has been an issue with ed tech companies in the past, selling student data. And more importantly, if the institution is going to, or not more importantly, but equally important, is if the institution is going to use this data for their own you know, edification, their own purposes, um, having a really robust way to filter that data and do their best to create you know, the unbiased algorithm, which is, that's a whole other conversation. But really thinking critically, like when we have all this raw data, that can be really empowering, but are we interpreting it in such a way that's actually effective and, and more importantly, equitable for our students? So this is kind of one of those ones that's, it's a little bit nebulous, it's a little less concrete because it just is such a huge, you know, overarching conversation. But I like spending a few minutes here because, as I said, I think this is going to become an increasingly larger part of the conversation as we move forward. What are we exposing our students to? How is their data being collected? How is it being used? And is it being used in their best interest? These are questions we really need to ask when onboarding any kind of campus-wide subscription but inclusive access programs specifically um, have a lot of access to this data and they, and they really do collect quite a bit of it. So having that conversation with the vendor is very important. All right, now I'm gonna take a moment or two to talk specifically about Texas and inclusive access. And I have to just give you guys a huge hand. Texas has done some amazing things uh, in terms of just you know advocating for students and, and their course materials. So Texas made great strides in ensuring that inclusive access programs are transparent. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So HB 1027 uh, passed in 2021, and I actually believe it takes effect this fall, I'm pretty sure, uh, fall of 2022. So this new act requires that Texas public colleges and universities explicitly disclose within the institution's course schedule, fee amount, student data terms of use, we love to see it, and opt out procedure. Very important and really excellent. Very happy to see this in legislation. Um, we're seeing a lot of chatter online about students being frustrated, not even because of the inclusive access program, but because the opt out process isn't very clear to them. So, so kudos there. Uh, second, requires institutions to itemize any course material fees charged to student accounts and ensures that vendor agreements are public records. Also very important in terms of accountability and making sure that vendors aren't making promises about programs that they don't upkeep in the actual contract. And then finally, the bill builds on the state's existing textbook transparency law and will apply beginning, oh yes, there it is, the fall 22 semester. So just kind of a quick overview of HB 1027. I'm actually going to drop a link in the chat uh, to an article that Spark wrote on it at the end of this in case you want a little bit more information and that article links out to some great resources as well uh, but once again just really we were very happy to see this this legislation go through usually these things have have great bipartisan support because people are interested in in, in students and in ensuring that that they can be successful and that they have what it, they need to be successful um, and this is also great as well because as institutions consider inclusive access programs they also have to consider uh, you know, the ramifications of onboarding such a program and the steps that they would need to take 
to be uh, up to code when they onboard these types of models. So once again, very brief overview. There's a lot more good information on this that I will provide at the end there. Okay, so wow, we've done a lot. Um, we've talked about a lot. What have we talked about? So we started by kind of defining inclusive access and inclusiveaccess.org. And then we worked through just a tiny little bit of the history of inclusive access programs, kind of really just when they kind of came into being. Um, then we discussed differences and similarities between inclusive access programs, the type of vendors that might offer an inclusive access program. And then we really dug into the nitty gritty of what inclusive access programs claim to offer and how those claims actually play out in reality. Uh, we talked about Texas and inclusive access. And now I'm gonna give you guys some tips on how to navigate inclusive access, right? We've got all this great information, we learned all these things, um, but what does it actually look like in real life? What's the practical application here? Great, okay. So first, you know, as an, an open advocate, <laughs> which has been quite a big part of my career, I would be remiss if I did not provide just a quick comparison chart between OER and inclusive access. So I think that this breaks down on about four points, four distinct points. So in, for OER, digital access is available by day at no cost to students and access is free forever. And that is a big thing that inclusive access claims to address, you know, that digital access is available by day one, and but students are directly billed for the cost later. So there's still that cost consideration. So see, we're, 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 we're talking about equity, we're meeting some equity standards, and then we're at this kind of this push and pull here, right? Second, for OER, students can choose a low cost print option if desired. So there's that universal design for learning, there's that differentiation available to students that, that might have different learning styles, and different learning needs. With inclusive access, print rental option may be available, but there is that additional cost. Third, students retain access to the materials forever in OER, it is openly licensed. For inclusive access, it typically does expire at the end of the course. And even in perpetual access, as I mentioned, there are restrictions. So there's still an access question here with inclusive access ironically. And finally, openly licensed so faculty can adopt materials to local needs. OER has been openly licensed since the beginning. Inclusive access is ultimately all rights reserved. So sometimes there is a little bit of custom uh, customization available in inclusive access programs that let you like take a chapter or two out of a book, um, but ultimately it is still copyright. So there is an ability to adapt or tailor uh, beyond just kind of chunking out different sections. And I do this OER and inclusive access comparison uh, not to say that OER is the perfect solution and we don't need inclusive access at all and we should all just do OER. I, I wanted to be clear that I, you know, um, I have kind of a practical view of OER. I understand why inclusive access has become so popular because it can be difficult or it can feel difficult for institutions to implement kind of a campus-wide, you know, OER initiative effectively. And then vendors come in with what seems to be a very comparable solution. And they say, oh, just, just do inclusive access. It's so much easier. Um, and, you know, in my experience, I've been very fortunate. I don't think I've ever worked with an administrator that was a bad faith actor. I think most administrators really do care about students and they want what's best for them. So when they hear that inclusive access, like, oh, that, that answers a lot of the, you know, equity things that I've been hearing about that students struggle with, with text affordability, I'll onboard this program. So I show this chart not to say that, you know, oh, well, we are easy to do what we are. I show it to say that inclusive access is trying to address some of the chatter it's heard for many years now around textbook affordability. My question is, are they really doing it equitably? Is it really inclusive access as they claim? All right, so let's dive, let's drill down a little bit deeper even. What, what can you do as an individual on your campus and how can you have you know, better conversations about inclusive access? So the first is be proactive. Make sure admin, faculty, students are aware of the OER initiative on campus because it, it, it is the more equitable option and why it has an impact. Once again, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one function, but just raising awareness around you know, truly equitable solutions is always a positive. Second, and this is, this is one of my favorites, ask questions. Challenge your campus to thoroughly examine the legal, financial, and ethical implications of new models like inclusive access. Once again, I really don't think administrators or people interested in these programs just, you know, they don't care. I think they really actually are trying to make a difference. I think they want to help students. That's why this asking questions, it can seem innocuous, but it's so important because sometimes vendors will sell it to you like it's the best thing since sliced bread and it can really feel like that. So it's taking that moment to just be sure that decision makers are actually not only asking those questions, but you're asking them like, hey, have you considered this aspect? 
Third, another great one, be rigorous. Ensure all claims about benefits and savings are backed up by evidence, including research and numbers in the contract. So I always take a minute here to pause just, just to kind of drive this point home. Um, I, was, <laughs> I purchased a lot of ed tech with HERF and CARES money during the pandemic. Um, and ed tech vendors were coming out of the woodwork. They knew there was money. They wanted a piece of it. Um, and I was told this ed tech could change my life. Every new piece of ed tech, every vendor's ele elevator pitch was basically like, school was bad, you'll onboard this and school will be good. Like they were just, this, they were saying, this will this will absolutely change everyone on your campus's life. Um, and it's not to say that the, what they were selling wasn't good. It's just to say that vendors have that agenda. You know, they're going to say like, oh, this, this, this is amazing. It'll change your life. So you onboard it and then you get to the contract part and you have some issues with the contract. And the vendor goes, oh, well, we can't change that. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't come down to the price. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to collect data for this reason. But I will tell you right now, I worked a lot with vendors. They will tell you things cannot change. They absolutely can. Remember that you have the power in this situation. You are the consumer. You're the person that's deciding to purchase and pay good money for their product. If you don't like their terms and conditions, push back. They will act like you can't. You definitely can. And if you say, no, I'm sorry, this is a deal breaker. You need to, you need to be more competitive. You need to come back to the table with us and actually, you know, make this work for everyone. They will do it because ultimately they want to make the sale. And, you know, it, it might be several conversations. It'll be a little bit more time, but trust me, they will say they can't make adjustments. They can. So don't be afraid to push back and use your rights as a consumer to really get a good deal for your students. And last but certainly not least, center equity. Put student needs and voices at the center of the conversation. There's always time to consult and listen. Uh, you know, the best way to find out what a population needs is to ask that population directly. And I always say this, speaking to students, it's one of those investments that has incredible dividends. If you just take the time, they will tell you what they need. They will tell you pretty bluntly and concisely, and they're willing to share that information once they're asked. Wow, I have really just rip through this presentation. Um, but so I think I think we're gonna end a, a quite a bit earlier than I thought we were going to. But I always like to, to end, uh, you know, with just kind of this statement, which is that students cannot learn from materials they cannot afford. That really is the summary of this whole spiel. My whole presentation is that the bottom line is whatever inclusive access is offering, you know, whatever we're trying to do in this larger course material affordability conversation, ultimately, if the student can't afford the material, they can't learn from it because they're not going to be able to access it. Um, and as my grandma would say, there you go and there you have it. So that about wraps up this presentation. Uh, if you have any further questions or you'd like some more resources, our logo says it all. We are inclusiveaccess.org. You can type that into your URL bar. Uh, and you know, tons of great resources will come up. All of the myths versus facts, we've got PDFs of that. You can bring them to a board meeting. You can bring them to an academic senate meeting. Um, We've got some questions you can ask as a student, as an administrator, as a faculty, as a policymaker. So we've got lots of handouts on our website. I'd be happy to uh, talk a little bit more about those if there's any questions. And uh, thank you so much for letting me join you today. And I hope I've made good on my promise to get you guys the facts on inclusive access. Thank you so much. Trudy, that was amazing. Spark and Moore Park College are just obviously so fortunate to have you as an instructional technologist, as an open education advocate, and I, and also grandmothers. Grandmas just have the best advice, don't they? So I'm glad that you, I'm glad you concluded with that. And I do want to point out that Heather has put the link to our webinar survey in the chat. So please do take a moment to complete that after the webinar or here, here in a second if you have time. We really appreciate that. And um, just a couple of observations on my part, Trudy, since we have a little time here. And then I'd like to invite anyone, I think maybe, uh, I think I see Rebecca Karoff of the UT system is off mic. So maybe she's got a question here in just a moment. But just a few things I wanted to mention. I'm so glad you brought up the issue of student data collection and privacy issues, because I think that's something a lot of folks don't think about whenever they're considering these inclusive access programs. So that's something that I think is a really important thing to consider, and I'm glad you brought that up. I also love that comparison chart between OER and inclusive access. I think it's it's just a good no-nonsense chart, and um, you know we'll, we're recording this. We're putting it on our YouTube channel and folks can, can take that and borrow it and use it in their own advocacy on their campuses. And the last observation I wanted to make, Trudy, is about your work as an instructional technologist and designer. 
we in Texas, my organization, along with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and ISCME, as many of you know, partner on a statewide survey and landscape analysis on open education in Texas. And one of the things that we found in our most recent iteration of that survey and report in 2021 was that the institutions that really are at the forefront of open education resource leadership in the state are engaging in cross office and cross staff and partner work, both on their campuses and beyond. And what was specifically mentioned was on a campus when librarians work with educational uh, technologists and designers and work with other staff on their campuses that, that and administrators and students were mentioned as well, that that's when they really are advancing to a leadership point in open education. So um, I just wanted to mention that as too as well. Um, but Rebecca, did you, uh, Dr. Karoff, did you have something you wanted to ask? And I see that we've got, uh, Prudence has put a question in and we've got some comments coming in, but go ahead, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much, Judith. And thank you, Trudy. It's great to um, meet you like this. Um, I have to have two questions and they're totally unrelated. So feel free to answer one or the, or both. But one of them is one of the, it is HB 1027 is great legislation, and we can't often say that about Texas legislation, so it's really nice to be able to do it with this example. Um, but it, for us, it's been that the challenge across the UT system with our institutions is getting faculty to understand that this law is going into effect. And it's, you know, you talked about faculty academic freedom, their purview and authority over determining their own course materials in the curriculum. It's been interesting to sort of just see how you know, publishers can have very easy access to individual faculty members and sell them products. And then when you try to sort of approach, you know, a more coordinated discussion of course materials across an institution, you're often just missing all sorts of individual faculty members and the way they make decisions. And I'm just wondering, I'm looking forward to look at looking at the Oregon materials that Amy put in the chat, but I'm just wondering like the, the ways in which you bring more and more faculty into understanding what inclusive access products are, because they mm -hmm. often don't have any clue. I mean, we're doing some work across the system, but I'd love to hear from you or others about that. That's, Rebecca, that's a fabulous, fabulous question. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so we, I, I hear you, this comes up a lot when I give these, uh, you know, talks and then have these discussions is that there is this really direct access that that publishers have to faculty, and they 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 definitely you know use it to their advantage. Um, I've talked to a lot of different institutions. I've seen a lot of different things implemented at many, many different campuses. But something I've actually noticed to be incredibly effective in this area is when librarians and and Judith, you actually really broke this down very well. This kind of like cross pollination that that we're noticing happening between librarians and instructional designers. There's kind of this new uh, nucleus forming in higher education as you move to this digital space and it's bringing you know departments that before were a little bit separate it's actually like they're becoming part of the same you know symbiotic relationship the same organism like they need each other to, to, to operate in this digital environment so to answer your question Rebecca when librarians and instructional technologists and designers so that's going to be instructional designers ed tech all of that when they are informed about inclusive access and at, at first glance you're like okay that's a little maybe a bit of a kind of roundabout way but i've actually seen incredible success because it's generally not too much of a lift to just kind of have a conversation an academic senate presentation for example can be a great way to accomplish this where you kind of get those stakeholders and like hey we want to make you informed of this it falls under your purview as ed tech and instructional designer to know about subscriptions of this nature librarians as course material falls under your purview when they are aware faculty go to them you know we've got we're talking libguides for oer right we're talking course materials from the library for their classrooms we're talking um they're going to the instructional designer because canvas will not work and and specifically the McGraw-Hill integration in Canvas isn't working and they want the book to load properly. We have found that to be incredibly helpful because faculty, instead of getting it from the publisher, now they're getting it, they're getting opposing information or kind of maybe contradictory information from places that they are already naturally going to constantly for help. So especially with EdTech, we've noticed that be really effective when you get a Canvas call from McGraw-Hill, oh, hey, you know, like, um, I notice here that you that you this kind of looks like an inclusive access thing. Are you aware that this might collect student data? Are you aware, et cetera? And I've I've um, talked with the structural designers. I've worked with them. 
it's quite simple once they get the information, they'll bring it up. They'll have talk, they'll bring it up in their trainings even. So not a bulletproof solution, but I found it incredibly helpful to just have a quick meeting among those stakeholders, inform their department heads, have that conversation. It spreads like wildfire throughout the campus. But great question, really good. Yeah, and, and Rebecca, you know, I think you brought up a very pragmatic issue of passing the 1027 legislation, just like with SB 810 and course marking is all good and well, but implementation is going to hold some challenges for our institutions. And, you know, we're aware of that. And um, Digitex and the coordinating board and other organizations, I have no doubt, are going to be working to put out resources to assist in that. Did, did, did you have another question, Rebecca? Well, it's so it's a little bit farther afield. So let's let other people ask questions. But thank you so much. If there's time at the end, it's a sort of broader stepping back question about the, the world. I think we've just got, got one here from Prudence, although I do want to say that I swear, you know, we have so many problems in our world. Climate change is kind of at the forefront of my mind right now. I'm actually working on a book on that. Um, and uh, I, I feel like if we put librarians and instructional technologists and designers to solving that problem and all the others in our world, <laughs> they would be solved. <laughs> so kudos to those of you but i tell you smart administrators and leaders like rebecca herself also you put throw them in the mix and i'm 100 percent convinced we could solve those problems but trudy prudence had a question here in the chat do publishers get more student info through inclusive access than through registration for third-party access Okay, yeah, so so Prudence, just to make sure I'm uh, understanding your question correctly, it sounds like you're you're referring to kind of this integration that happens with publisher materials in a learning management system, that type of third party access, is that kind of what you're referring to? Uh, yes, my students, you, we use, Pe I'll just put it out there, we use Pearson. I have like a widget in my, in D2L, they click on that, they go to register using their access code, and then that's how they get access to their uh, e-text, homework, tests, all the things that we need. Uh, not all, but most of the things we need to use for the course. And uh, we've got some people that are using uh, inclusive access and are proponents of it, but I'm like, I know they get some information from my, from my kids because they have to put in name and, and all that uh, when they register and they have to agree to, you know, like these conditions. Uh, but I'm just wondering, do they get more, like if it's already billed to them, do, does the publisher have even more information than what they would normally get? So, okay, excellent. So really, you guys are really, you really brought your A game today because these are exactly the types of questions. This, we're really getting into the nitty gritty. So the short answer to your question, Prudence, is yes, they do have more access to student information via an inclusive access program. And the reason for that is because third-party integrations, and I, I don't wanna really get into the legalese and, and contract stuff too much, but they're, they come under a different kind of purview because we have contracts with our learning management systems and then those learning management systems allow third-party integrations, but there's a few more layers there. So it's a little more kind of removed. There's some more steps there and they're only allowed certain access. Like you mentioned, we've got some names, that type of stuff, maybe a student ID number. In inclusive access, because it's a subscription where they're interacting not through a third-party integration, but with the installed, well, it is a third-party integration, but they're, they're interacting with the textbook material um, kind of more like a piece of ed tech directly within the LMS. It is gleaning quite a bit more information and it's, it's under their purview to do that. They have it built into their contracts. So it's getting information like not just student names and ID numbers, but how students are interacting with the textbook, um, how often they're reading it, how often they're opening it, what, you know, what course materials they're looking at more, how many hours or minutes they're spending on courseware, whether or not they do anything about it. And um, so not only can this data be sold, but there's also, this is another part of the conversation, I'll touch on it very briefly, this concept of using data to determine things about student populations to try to improve their learning experience. So if we notice that you know a certain demographic of student is spending much longer in the textbook than another demographic, we might try to glean information from that. And the textbook publisher certainly does. And they might make changes to their textbook because of that. But our question is like, how rigorous is that testing? Like what, 
okay, you know, is there, is this causation or correlation? What's actually going on here? So then now we're opening up a huge can of worms. So short answer, yes, it collects quite a bit more data than just a, a normal uh, run the mill integration would. You know what, Trudy, to bring in the analogy of climate change again, the problem with using historical data to make predictions is mm. that sometimes what in climate change, weather is changing so rapidly that it, you're doing a great disservice if you're using historical data when weather and climate change have really um, changed over you know, thousands and millions of years as opposed to the great change, exponential change that's happening now. Students, the student population and demographics are changing so much. So if you're using historical data on students, especially if you're looking at more traditional, a, what they think of as traditional age students, then you're not gonna be able to make very accurate predictions about the reality of students now and today, I would say. But Prudence did that. I, I didn't know if Prudence wanted to respond or had any other, other things she wanted to follow up and we could come back to Rebecca then. Now, you just mentioned groups that they belong to. So they know like a, they know things like age and their, I mean. It, it, de know? it depends on how they're collecting the information. Yes, they do actually. And it's, it's this is, now we're getting into the, <laughs> the nitty gritty of like data collection and, and, and how they siphon this type of information. But, and, and I don't, I don't, you know, I like to couch everything I say in, in practicality and reality. I don't want to ever, um, I want to keep what I say practical and usable. So I don't want to get into predictions about what we suspect textbook publishers are doing with data, although I could do that. But they absolutely are accessing more and more granular data with these kinds of integrations. So we have actually seen, yes, age, demographic information, ethnicity, even to a point. So that is, yes, that's becoming more and more a part of the type of data they're interested in gathering. And we are we are seeing shifts in the way they manage their data collection. Well, I was just going to say, as an instructor, I have access to like how long they spend on a problem or something like that. They give that to me. And sometimes it means something and sometimes it doesn't. But I don't know. That just seems, you know, that that's worrisome. Just just leaving it there. It's worrisome. Exactly. No, Prince, that's exactly it. Right. It's, it's just it's it, it's um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right. So it's we're trying to see where what are the potential misuse of this because, you know, data has significant potential to be misused, unfortunately. I, for one, really appreciate Prudence, your in the trenches instructor perspective on this issue. And it sounds like your, your students are lucky to have you, it sounds like, because you seem very trying to be very cognizant and aware of these issues. So good for you. But it's complex. So we have about uh, eight minutes eight, seven minutes left. Oh, Krista Quigley says, Prudence is amazing. That's wonderful. I love, what a great community. <laughs> so I don't think we, you know, we've had some really good resources put into the chat. And um, I want to say, Rebecca, before I come back to you, I didn't know if you had a moment, Trudy. You had mentioned a resource on the Spark site. Oh, yes. That was, I think related to, to 1027. It was, yes. Let me, yes. let me pull that up. Really you just quickly. pause. I think we've got the time if you want to pause and then we'll come back to you, Rebecca. And if any other, you know, we still have some time. We'll, um, anybody else has any other questions or comments or anything, please feel free to put them in the chat and or any other resources that you want to share. But that's, you know, Texas is a huge state and that can cause a lot of complexities with higher education, but it also can mean that there's a lot of resources to draw on, human resources, you and your colleagues and your students as well. And I think that, you know, I myself am so grateful for that within this huge, great state that we do call Texas. Rebecca, let me come back to you. Thank you. And actually, I have a question in part about the library world. So, Trudy, I appreciate you bringing mention the library folks. And I just want to say, since two of our OER librarians from UT Rio Grande Valley and UT Arlington are on this in this um, Zoom room, Jessica McLean, Jessica McLean and Gabby Hernandez are amazing colleagues. And and I do work with the library library folks. I'm a student success person in my system role, but it turns out the libraries are utterly, you know, at the heart and the locus and the center of student success in so many different ways, including the OER piece. So, but I, but my question is partly just about, and it's not even a question. I guess I would love your thoughts as a thought leader around the parallels between how you see this growth and in inclusive access and also 
the, the, and the tension that especially creates for those of us who are trying so hard to advance OER, but also the, so in the scholarly communications world, you know, what's happening with it, sort of trying to go towards more open scholarship and different kinds of publisher contracts, our system and the entire state is doing that. California has been phenomenal, phenomenal in, in leading some of that, others too. So I'm just wondering how you even might frame the sort of the parallels, the tension, any thoughts you have about how to even navigate that in ways that are meaningful to institutional leadership, to not the library folks, they get it, but um, you know, sort of going beyond that. Also faculty too have a role to play here. And I think they're often so wedded to just make sure I get my uh, you know, access to Elsevier and, and nature and science and all those other things. Um, don't, don't you know, try to mess that up for me. And I don't mean to, I'm speaking a little bit disparagingly of faculty, I don't mean at all, but how do we, how do we sort of view these as parallel movements and sort of address some of the tension that exists there? Well, Rebecca, just wow, really, really good question. These are like dream questions. This is like we're really getting into the heart of these issues, which I, which I absolutely love. Because yeah, this is the stuff that I, I think on quite a bit. Um, how to address the parallels in this tension? So I think that this is, you know, this is one of those excellent big questions, big picture questions. And there's a lot of directions I could go, but I'll try to to be as concise and complete as possible. Um, a couple of things. I, I would say that I've that I've noticed, and I'm going to start pretty broad. So I, I apologize if this is pretty nebulous. But the word empowerment, we use it a lot in higher ed. You know, it's it's definitely a, a bit of a buzzword, although no less impactful for that reason. Um, something that I have noticed that has been incredibly effective about this conversation and parallels between this, you know, open access, OER, this this kind of this this trend towards removing barriers to learning materials and also the tension that exists when we've got heavy hitting publishers, three publishers on 80% of the market, they're interested in continuing to corner that market and to, quite frankly, gatekeep learning materials behind a paywall. Um, and they've got the resources to make that paywall attractive to faculty because it's full of all these ancillary materials. So, you know, I, I get it. I, the tension really makes sense to me, as you said, like faculty are being I'll just address you as faculty, whoever's faculty in the room. You really have, in the past two years, you've been asked to be instructional designers, ed tech specialists, full-time faculty, learning management system administrators, uh, universal design for learning and regular and effective contact experts. Like, faculty have been asked to really transform the entire way that they do school in, on top of being content experts, um, often in a way that is burdensome, in a way that they cannot really sustain. And so I understand back, I understand this tension. I really do. Like I work with faculty every day. I have incredible respect for what they do. And that's why this word empowerment keeps coming into my mind because school was the first time I realized I had agency in my life. I didn't have a traditional experience um, growing up. I actually didn't go to school past sixth grade and I put myself through community college. And when I got there, it was the first time where I was like, oh my word, I can take information I can learn something and it can literally change the way I'm making decisions in my life because I have this additional information that I didn't have before and it's allowing me to transform my thinking, which is transforming my actions and, 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 and my whole thought pattern. And that's a big nebulous place to start, but faculty and not, and not in a way that I'm asking you to do more because genuinely, I don't want that to be what it comes across as. Faculty are the content experts. They know what their students need. I have found it to be incredibly empowering for faculty to talk to them as though they are publishing experts, as though they are content experts. Because a lot of this tension I notice, though very real, is on some level fabricated because of a thought pattern, because a way of thinking about course materials, this concept that like there's a publisher somewhere in New York that knows what's best for every student in America. And if we don't go to that publisher and use their materials, we don't, we're not gonna have quality materials. I think what's been really helpful for faculty is, is having these deeper conversations about what's a learning material? Is it a YouTube video? Is it a library resource? Is it a textbook at all? And I know it's difficult. It's difficult to get away from this concept, this conceptualization of a textbook being the way that we do it, but we have access to resources, unmitigated access compared to what you know people in the past have had. And I think these conversations of respect and empowerment towards faculty of saying, what do you wanna do? And not, 
what more can you do? Which I think a lot of the way that it's phrased, but what do you want to do? Because I have seen classes that utilized YouTube videos and some free library resources. And it took literally, I was, I worked with this faculty member, it took about 45 minutes to find these materials that they wanted. And they dropped the textbook. They dropped the textbook. They built it all into their course. They had this and it worked. It worked perfectly. The student test scores skyrocketed because now instead of hashing up a te te textbook, this one size fits all t-shirt of a textbook, they just gave the students exactly what they needed to be successful in their course. And so I think reframing this as not what more can faculty do, but what do you want to do? And do you have to have a publisher tell you what that is? And that, you know, this all knowing eye in the sky, what do you want to do and how can we have a conversation about it? And that's a rough answer because it's not this quick and easy like response, but I have noticed that when we kind of just reframe the whole conversation of beyond textbook affordability, beyond the textbook even, faculty are like, oh, this is not, I do know what my students need. I work with them. And it's not as much of a hump as it appears initially. So that was kind of <laughs> nebulous, but I, I hope Rebecca that I, I answered a sliver. But you know, the question was nebulous. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca, for your great questions and prudence as well. And I think ending on the note of the importance of faculty and instructors mm -hmm. to the open education movement is a great one. So, so thank you for bringing that up. And I really do want to emphasize we could not do this without our subject matter experts, our faculty and instructors. So thank you so much, Trudy. You are both brilliant and inspiring. So thank you so much for this great information. Lots of great takeaways, I think, pragmatic um, strategies. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope I did drop that link to that webinar survey in there again. So if you can just take, it's a very brief survey, take a moment. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Please do stay safe and, uh, and take good care. And just thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. It was an honor to be here. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.